Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to the first session on the last day. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Spedding. I'm the program leader for the Environmental Stewardship Program at the Australian Antarctic Division. Um, and I have the pleasure of chairing today's session on sea ice uh, interactions, which is the investigations of sea ice and ocean processes, interactions of the ocean with ice shelves and sea ice, as well as the influence of sea ice on a global climate system. Obviously, an extremely relevant and important topic based on um, everything that we're seeing in the media and the findings that have been presented um, in real time throughout this conference. So um, our first speaker today is Natalie Robinson from NIWA, um, who's going to speak to us today on an unprecedented season for sea ice, a view from the ocean. Kia ora everyone, thank you very much for um, making it here for the first session after the night before. Um, I've, I have been interested and remain interested in um, the flow of ice shelf water that comes out from uh, underneath the Ross Ice Shelf and flows through Western McMurdo Sound. Um, we've been studying this for many years and so we've gained some understanding of it. Um, I want to... <laughs> Um, uh, but the last time I spoke to you, um, I addressed the problem of the timing that you have in terms of your uh, data collection. So these are data I showed last time, and these are 300 profiles of uh, temperature collected over 24 hours, so very high resolution. Um, and the problem is that uh, if instead of being having the luxury of collecting over 24 hours, you just have sort of one hour on site, if you happen to be there at, say, the first section, you're going to get quite a different picture of what the ocean's doing compared to the, the second section. And the same is true if I show you the um, salinity data. Um, so if we highlight the same two pieces of the, the whole section, Obviously, you're going to get quite a different picture of what the um, ocean structure is. But we can translate um, our temperature and salinity measurements into degree of supercooling. So this is how far below the in-situ freezing temperature the water is. And as you can see, these two profiles would give us quite a similar picture for the, for the one location. And it's actually true of the whole record. So we've got here... Um, a parameter that can give us um, a consistent picture of what the, what the water column is like. So in the meantime, I've gone away and um, QC'd um, 1,800 profiles that have been taken through McMurdo Sound to produce these maps of um, the supercooling in the sound. But the problem with these maps is that um, they're biased by the period that we're able to actually go and collect the data, which typically is October and November of each year. So you can see there's a lot of um, the year that's not being captured. <clears throat> so to get around this problem, uh, we wanted to put in a year-round mooring um, and potentially in the main flow of this ice shelf water that comes out from under the ice shelf. <clears throat> so we've come up with this new system. There were several challenges to be overcome. Um, one is that, of course, we're working from sea ice that is very likely to blow out. So we can't do our usual thing, which is to suspend the instruments from the sea ice and leave it dangling in the water, because that sea ice might disappear and take our instruments with it. Um, so the solution to that, therefore, was to have um, what is more standard for oceanographic observations, to put um, a seafloor-mounted uh, string with floats that hold the the line with all the instruments attached up through the water. But we face two further challenges. One is that we're going to need to be putting this through and recovering it um, through a jiffy hole, which is only 25 centimetres wide. So that presents quite a challenge. And the other is that the actual, um, the ocean itself, the upper 70 metres of it is super cooled. So anything we put in that section of the water column is going to attract ice growth rapidly and make it 
well, if we can even find it again, it will be very difficult to recover. So we wanted to avoid the upper 70 metres. So our solution is to have um, the top component of the mooring string, um, a rope canister with an acoustic release. So when we come back to collect it, um, we send the signal that the um, rope canister can release, and then that's going to float up to where we can collect it at the surface. So this makes it doable, but it remains quite challenging. So as a proof of concept, um, we deployed this array uh, in October of 2021 under what we might consider normal sea ice conditions. Uh, however, as we were watching the uh, growth of the sea ice over the following season, it turned out to be quite an unusual season for sea ice. So this is actually an image of, on the right, we've got an image of McMurdo Sound at, in late August. And um, I've circled in yellow the only section of fast ice that was available. So basically all of McMurdo Sound is full of open water and this is extremely unusual for this time of year. Uh, if you are interested in knowing more about that, first of all, listen to Jackie's talk later. Um, oh, and I think Yulia's going to talk about that next as well. But there's also a um, podcast on RNZ where we talk about the implications of that unusual season. <coughs> and it also had implications for the way we did our sampling. So we were um, taking core samples of the platelet ice and we exploited that um, unique situation to get a unique set of data, which Jackie's going to talk about later. <clears throat> but going back to the mooring, so this is our, um, this is what we're trying to deal with. So what you can see at the top of the image is what's nearly six metres of individual ice crystals that have accumulated underneath the um, surface of the sea ice. And at this point, we have um, sent the acoustic signal and the rope canister has floated up. Now, if you look carefully, you can see that, well, hopefully you can see, that the line that, the, um, that comes away from the rope canister down to the rest of the mooring is at quite an angle. So it's come up under quite strong currents and it's moved a long way across. Um, and you can just see one of the floats that has gone up into the start of the platelet ice. So our job now is to locate it and find our way through all the platelets, hook onto it and bring it up to the surface. And the, um, the chain that's hanging down, which we're now viewing through our live view GoPro, is our attempt to actually locate where are we going to pull it up from. So we're incredibly lucky to come down right on top of it. Uh, and this is the moment when um, the first of the floats actually came up through the hole and we finally had our hands on the top of the mooring again. I'm hoping that you can see the joy on our faces. It was, it was quite a moment. <laughs> and there you go, there's the first um, components of the mooring making it through, and we've finally got our hands on it again. So then it remains to pull those instruments up. So um, we set up the tripod on top of the hull um, and then attach the, um, the rope to a Hagland, and my job is to reverse the Hagelin slowly, um, and then the rest of the team are taking the instruments off the line as it comes up and out of the water. <clears throat> um, so now I'm just going to give you the, a little bit of a look at the data. So the first thing we can expect is that if we've got this seafloor mounted array, even if it's got quite a lot of flotation, it's going to be subject to um, the ocean currents. So if we can expect a tidal current um, in one direction, we might get what we call blowdown of the, um, of the whole array. And conversely, when the, when the tides reverse, we're going to get it going in the other direction. So if the first thing we look at is the pressure record from that topmost instrument, we can see um, that the tidal movement accounts for what might be three or four metres of um, change of, of height of that topmost instrument, but that throughout the year we've also got these other events where um, as much as 40 metres of blowdown of that top instrument. Now if we plot all of the pressure records, we can see the same thing happening through all of them, but to a reduced extent as we go down towards the sea floor. So that's exactly what we'd expect with that sort of activity. 
But coming to the, to the temperature data itself, um, how do we know whether the data that we collected is normal or has it been affected by this very unusual um, sea ice season? So the only data I had available to me already to, to compare with were these four records. Now the two blue records were thermistors that were attached to the Scott Base jetty. Um, so that gives you one location and not very deep that you have an opportunity to put some um, instruments on. And then the other records in yellow and red are two winter experiments that um, were led by Pat Langhorn, but um, were again r restricted in timing by what um, the sea ice was doing. So um, the, the yellow one actually starts in September. You can see it at the end of the record here. Um, when the sea ice had sufficiently formed that you could hang your instruments from the sea ice. And the red one, um, again, could only be deployed in, in April by the same method. So we're missing quite a part of the year. But if we come to our new data from, from last year, we can see that it follows the same sort of pattern of a lot of variability and warming over the summer months and then it calms down into the winter uh, and basically the, the water column homogenizes. But we do have some interesting sort of events happening towards the end of the record. So if I just um, highlight those, this is the last four months of that record. We appear to have some events where the whole water column is homogenizing, followed by a return to a stratification. And we seem to have um, two sets of these events. So I put my thinking cap on and tried to explain this to myself. Um, and the hypothesis that I came up with was that this is a, a local event, uh, followed by, oh sorry, which is potentially driven by um, a strong wind event that could overturn the, the water column and um, also have an influence of new ice formation right at the surface over top of the mooring. And then this is followed by, sort of when that switches off, a return to the, the larger scale regional signal which is um, driven by the Ross Sea Polynia. And so um, two of those sort of events, if you like. Um, but the issue with that hypothesis is that if we, if we separate out those different temperature records so you can actually see them individually, um, now, if I just mark the start of that particular uh, event, you can see it actually starts in the deep water. So that is not a surface-driven event. Um, but the other thing is that something curious is happening when you bring in the, the salinity measurements, which I've added in the bottom here. So when we look at the temperature in the top record, we see almost no change, but that's probably because it's at the freezing point already, but we do see a large step change in the salinity at the top of the water column. Okay, so that might be um, the sea ice forming right there. But we are seeing the step change in the temperature records of the very lowest part of the water column, and almost nothing really to reflect that in the salinity. So um, this is a bit of a puzzle and I don't have an answer. Um, if, if someone does, or some ideas, um, please let me know. But I just thought I'd finish by mentioning that there's some other mechanisms in play. Um, the Hut Point Peninsula uh, carries on under sea, so we actually have the sill, and potentially we've got flow coming over the sill and being affected uh, as we're just observing it on the other side of the sill. Um, potentially you could have a front passing by, which might explain why you're seeing it in the deepest waters first. Or um, a third possibility is that we're actually seeing an intrusion of a specific water mass. And in this case, that would be um, high salinity shelf water coming from either the Ross Sea Polynia or potentially the Terranova Bay Polynia even. So um, in the coming season, the task is to recover that mooring and then redeploy it into the uh, main axis of the ice shelf water plume. Um, and it just remains for me to say a big thank you to my team and all of the other collaborators I've had over the years. Look out for a full-length um, documentary film to come out next year. 
And if you are interested in following up any of these aspects, there's plenty available on my personal web page there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, thank, thanks, Natalie. Uh, wonderful presentation, some fantastic images there from below the ice. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions? We've got about t time for about uh, one or two questions. Can't see anybody up there. Oh. Thank you, that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, any opportunity for deploying more than just the one? Oh, you mean? I know it looks like an, an amazing feat, but I was just thinking about you know when you're talking about the sill, having observations in multiple spots. Oh yes. So um, as I say, that was a proof of concept, um, and it was uh, accordingly very lightly instrumented. Um, we did actually have a current meter on the top of it, which an acoustic current meter which failed to operate, unfortunately. So hopefully that'll work next time. Um, but the yes the. The idea was that this was just to prove that we could do it, and then um, uh, we've got plans to put a, put a similar sort of array in the Ross Sea Polinia, um, and yeah, this, this really opens up a whole heap of opportunities that we have this capability now, yeah. Happy to talk if you've got some ideas. <laughs> um. Please, uh, that's about all time we have for now, so please take the opportunity to uh, track down uh, Natalie over the break, and uh, please join me in thanking her again.